Luke chapter 19, I'm going to be reading two scriptures briefly today. Luke chapter 19 and Matthew chapter 21. So you can follow along with us. The scriptures will be on the screen, but you can also follow along with us. Luke 19, 28 to 39 and Matthew 21, 1 to 10. I'll be reading out of the Amplified Version. Uh, you know, there's different versions in the Bible. As people ask, like, what, what is it? You know, what are these versions? There's some easy versions, and if you're new, I would suggest you get like an NLT or an NIV, which is New Living Translation, New International Version. Those are easier versions. Um, somebody was telling me the other day, I'm, I'm trying to read the Bible, and they're reading the King James Version. And I said, first of all, you weren't born in 1430. How you talk like that? Thou and thee and thus saith the... I don't talk like that, so I need to read something that I understand. The Amplified is just... It, it's exactly what it is. It amplifies the scriptures. It makes them louder. And so we'll be reading out of the Amplified Version. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 19, verse 28. It says, after saying these things, Jesus went on ahead of them going up to Jerusalem. Verse 29, when he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a donkey's colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. I'm going to park there for a second because in the first service I read this and I missed it. I missed it until this first service. I was preaching the first service. And I realized that, that Jesus sends his disciples into a village that he had been into. He says, go into the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a donkey's colt tied on which no one has ever sat. And I realize this, being a follower of Jesus, the reason I follow Jesus is he can see things I cannot. Let me say that again. He can see things that I cannot see. And I realized after I read this scripture in the first service, I realized that Jesus had been there in the spirit. He had been there. Because he saw, he told the disciples what they were about to see. This is why it's so important you follow Jesus in, instead of following people. Because sometimes we follow people, but they're not, they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Jesus does. They don't know what's in the next town. Jesus does. And this is why I follow Jesus. Because he told them, I'm going to tell you what you're going to see. I'm going to tell you exactly what you're going to see. And he tells them to go ahead into the village. And you're going to find a donkey. On which no one has ever sat. Say with me, new. new. Say with me, new. new. It was a new donkey. It was a new car. That was Jesus' new car. And the Bible says this. If anybody asks you why you're untying the colt. If anybody asks you why you're untying the colt. You will say, the Lord. The Lord needs it. Say with me, the Lord needs it say it again the Lord, the Lord needs it this is important because Palm Sunday commemorates the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem Palm Sunday commemorates the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem where they placed palm branches in his path before his arrest on Holy Thursday and his crucifixion on Good Friday it marks the beginning of Holy Week the final week of Lent Lent is 40 days, and, and it, it commemorates Jesus' 40 days in the desert. So they did this 40 days before Jesus' death. 40 days, Lent. And I was reading the scripture, and the Lord began to just deal with me. He said, if, if anybody asks you why you're untying the colt, you will say the Lord needs it. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody's coming to my house, and I don't know who they are, and they get in my car, my brand new car, and I go outside, if you're not the repo man, why are you in my car? Has anybody ever, you've thought about that? Like, Jesus, how the heck are these people going? You're sending them to a, another town that you're not in, to get somebody's brand new coat. Nobody's ever sat on it, right? That's what the Bible said. This guy's about to shoot me, Jesus. What's going on? 
If anybody asks you, why are you untying the coat? You will say, you will say, the Lord. This is important. The Lord needs it. See, everything that is written in the Bible means something. And I decided to go look in the scriptures and say, what does it mean that the Lord needs it? And as I looked in the Greek, the word needs it means duty or business. Now it makes sense to me as I went back. I said, oh, the Lord needs it. Oh, the Lord has business to attend to. That's what it really means, that, that Jesus has business to attend to. I came here for a purpose. I came here for a reason. And I have business to attend to. The Lord needs it. And then I thought, I went a step further and I said, okay, God, wait a minute. Because you're using a colt, a donkey. But what about me? What about me? Do you need me? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, yes, I need you. The Lord needs you. See, too many times we sell ourselves short and we say, I'm not worthy because I did this and this and this. And I'm not worthy because I, I messed up here and I'm not worthy. But I'm here to tell you that the Lord needs you. He needs you to do what he's called us to do in this world. This is why some of us struggle because we're going through tribulations and trials and, and we're trying to figure this thing out and, and all of a sudden I fall and I, I make mistakes and then, and then here comes the whispering enemy and he says you're not worthy and he says you'll never make it and I live my life based on what somebody's whispering to me but I'm here to break that today and tell you that the Lord needs you come on you should clap there the Lord needs it. The Lord has business to attend to. There's business that he needs to do. And too many of us have been distracted. Oh my gosh, this week I was distracted. I tell you, I told my wife, we have these conversations sometimes. And I told her, I said, babe, I'm, I, I feel distracted. I feel discouraged. You see, this week I, I was dealing with bronchitis. Should have went to my doctor, Rosie. And somebody gave me aspropicemin. What's that medicine called? Aspropicemin? <laughs> Jess, what's it called? What's it called? That thing, azromidacin. <laughs> I'd be changing the name every week. I said, give me one of those pills. And I felt like I was getting better. And so Wednesday night I came to church and I was not good. And, and I, during the preaching, Vic preached an awesome message, and I was in my office laying down just watching. And I, I, I tried to go out and say hi to some people, and I was not feeling it. So my wife and I both were not feeling well. We went home. And Thursday, I wasn't feeling good, and I started taking the medicine. I said, I feel better. You know, you know when, when you feel better, but you really don't feel good? And so I got up. I was like, let's go, you know, let's go eat some breakfast. Maybe I'll feel better. And I ate like I was healed, but. <laughs> you know, you, when you're sick, you should be losing weight. I be gaining weight when I'm sick, right? What's wrong with that? Come on, Bailey. So I wasn't feeling good. And so Thursday I decided I'm just going to go back home. Nana, cancel practice. She wasn't feeling well either. Cancel practice. We're just going to, we're going to stay home. And I rested. And then the next day, Friday came and I wasn't feeling too well and I stayed home and, I, and, and here's what happened. I felt a spirit of depression and a spirit of discouragement come upon me. And, and I didn't want to read my Bible and I was like, I just don't feel good. And, and man, we're getting close to Easter and Palm Sunday and there's so many things God wants to do. I don't feel good. I'm taking my medicine. I'm, I, I'm just resting and I'm sitting there. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, you, you got to know that there's a purpose for you. And this is why discouragement has come upon you. And this is why depression has come upon you. It's okay to rest. Sometimes I beat myself up like, no, nah, I got to go. I gotta, I'm one of those that I got to keep going. And it's okay to rest. But here's what happens. Some of us stay asleep. When we should be up, we should be up praying, but we're up on TikTok all night. We should, be, we should be up in our word and we're, we're too busy scrolling. 
And we could scroll for hours and be in the Bible three minutes and be like this. <laughs> Falling asleep. Why is that? Because there's an enemy that wants to distract us and keep us away from the purpose that God has for us. And so I, I, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, son, you have the authority. You have the word in here. And what comes from here comes out of here. And I remember, I just, I, I, I wasn't feeling when I said, I take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. I take every thought captive, whatever the enemy's trying to do to me. I rebuke depression and I rebuke discouragement. And I'm a son, I'm a son of the most high God. Let me tell you, you're not the only one who gets discouraged, but the Lord needs you. And that's why you're being attacked. Watch this. So he says, look, if anyone says, anyone says anything you should say, the Lord needs them. And watch this. And without delay, the owner will send them with you. Ooh. Okay, okay. I'm going ahead of myself. Verse 30. Verse 30. It says, go into the village ahead of you. Now watch this. Jesus knew the heart of the owner. He knew the heart of the owner. Watch this. Go into the village, ready? As you enter, you will find a donkey coat tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. Uh, untie it and bring it here. How can Jesus say that? Because he knew the owner's heart. Yes. Now, now it goes a step further. Because I love how it says that no one has ever sat upon it. In other words, it was brand spanking new. So it's like, it's like somebody coming to my house and saying, um... I need the keys to your BMW. Well, your wife's BMW. Oh, let me take it a step further. I need the keys to your 1966 VW convertible bug. That's mine. I need the keys to that thing. Now, if you know, I've been looking for a convertible VW bug my whole life. I've had four VW bugs and they've all been hard tops. And I, for my whole life, I had been looking, I'm going to get me a 1966 convertible VW bug. Why? Because my dad had bugs when he was growing up. So I wanted to have that part of me like, I'm going to have a bug. I found one. And I realized I don't love it as much as I used to. Matter of fact, I'm selling it if somebody wants it. I'm not giving that sucker away. I'm sorry. I put too much money into it. But let me tell you something. If God told me to give it away, I would give it away. Why? Because God knows that 1966 VW Bug convertible, red, cream top, custom interior, subwoofer. I can't be driving. I'm too old to be driving that thing. Bumping down the street. I was bumping the other day with Hezzy. We went to Home Depot. I was bumping Christian music. Forest. Go into the village and have you there. As you enter, you will find a donkey's coat tied on which no one has ever sat. If God told me to give it away, I'd give it away. Why? Because God knows your heart. And the question that arose to me as I, as I read this scripture, Jesus knew the heart of the owner and he knew he wouldn't delay. The donkey had never been sat upon. In other words, it was brand new. And the question that came to me is, what do you have to offer Jesus? Are you willing to give him your best? What are you willing to give Jesus? See, that showed me that this man didn't care about that it was brand new. Because it didn't have a hold on him. Who had a hold on him was Jesus. See, this tells me this guy was a believer. He knew about Jesus. Because you can't just let somebody in your house and just give it to him. He knew who needed it. That's why he says, if they ask you, tell them, I have need for it. Jesus has business. This tells me that guy was prophetic. He knew who had need of it. And because he knew who had need of it, he says, I want to be part of his purpose. Oh, let me help some of you. Because you're either a part of someone's purpose or you're pulling them away from their purpose. Some of you missed it. What do you have to offer Jesus? Stop giving him in Spanish. We say migajas. 
Stop giving Jesus crumbs. Just enough. This tells you right here that Jesus deserves the very best, not the least. It's going to hurt a little bit. Jesus deserves your very best. Give him the best of your business. Give him the best of your job. Give him the best of everything you have and you'll never be without. Jesus deserves the best. Are you willing to give him your best? See, we use Jesus sometimes as a, as a genie. Only when I need you. Only when I need prayer. Only when I need something. And Jesus ain't no genie. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He died on the cross so that I could be free. He deserves the very best. What do you have to offer Jesus? The Bible goes on and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 7, verse 6. I want to read verse 6, Matthew 21, 6. Then the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. This hit me last night as I was reading this again, just got going over my notes. And I realized that, that the disciples didn't question him. Come on, if... If Jesus tells you, hey man, go steal that guy's car over there, tell him I need it. It's exactly what they did. They went and stole somebody's car because they did it. Uh, Pastor, they stole it? Yeah, because they didn't go tell the owner. He said, if he asks you. So in other words, you're going to go steal it for me. Uh, Georgie and Oli, they used to be like, we're going to steal for Jesus, Pastor. They used to bring, uh, they worked at a steel company. And they used to tell me this. I said, like, we're stealing for Jesus. I'm like, stop saying that. <laughs> keep bringing me steal because we got to keep making stuff at the church. But just tell him it fell off the truck. <laughs> me and Hezzy were at Home Depot yesterday. <laughs> I'm in my bug and obviously people see it and they stop. And, and there was a, a van that pulled up and it was like kind of quick. I was like, oh man. Like, and he was like, hey, you need a projector? I'm like, brother, is it 1990? Who, who has a projector anymore? He's like, oh, I'm, I got projectors. I got, I got surround sound. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. And they were driving around the parking lot. I was like, man, whose truck did that fall off? Anyways, it happens. Don't be buying that stuff. You know it's stolen. We got cops here. Okay. Then the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Are you doing what Jesus is instructing of you? Or you question everything he's asking of you. The problem is, is we question everything and we rarely do anything. They were questioning. They didn't question. They, they did, went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Obedience precedes blessing. If you want God to bless you, you got to first obey. Uh, it, it, it's okay. You don't need to clap. It hurts. Verse 7, and they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their coats on them, and Jesus sat on the coats. What does this mean? Jesus sat on the donkey. He did this both as a deliberate fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah 9 9 and as a demonstration of the character of his kingdom. It was a spiritual kingdom, not a military kingdom. He came in peace, not war. See, you're about to see right now what the people wanted. They wanted Jesus to conquer the Romans. They thought Jesus was going to come in and take over as king. But they didn't realize this is not a political thing. This is a spiritual thing. See, I realized that he didn't come to conquer, but to give his life as a ransom for ours, a messenger of peace. He didn't come to conquer like they wanted him to. But I'm here to tell you that he conquered the grave. He conquered death. He resurrected on the third day and that's why we praise him today so he may not have conquered militarily but he conquered spiritually and he is coming back for his bride without spot or wrinkle he didn't come to conquer but to give his life as a ransom for ours and we're going to celebrate that on Friday you see in verse 8 Matthew 21 says this most of the crowd spread their coats on the road as before a 
while others were cutting branches from the trees. And this is where we get Palm Sunday. They were cutting palm branches and putting them on the road and spreading them all over the road. And I realized that a great multitude gathered to lay palm branches, which were a symbol of Jewish nationalism. The crowd looked to Jesus as a political and national savior, but not so much as a spiritual savior. You know what's interesting? I love this verse in Luke chapter 19 at the end of the verse. It's about Zac uh, Zacchaeus. And it says at the end of Zacchaeus giving all of his wealth back and saying, if I stole from it, I'll give, I'll give four times as much back. And the Bible says at the end of that chapter, it says he came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to conquer and, and take over the Romans at that. No, no, no. He came to seek and to save everyone who's lost. This is what I love about Jesus. This is what I love about CWC. Because CWC is intentionally multi-ethnic. Martin Luther King said this. He says, the most segregated time is on Sunday at 11 a.m. Some of you missed it. The most segregated time on the earth is Sunday at 11 a.m. When the black church is over here and the white church is here and the Asian church is here and the Latino church is over here. And every other church is separated. But we chose to do something different. We chose to be different. We chose to be like it's going to be in heaven. Ain't no, gonna be no black church over here. If there's a, I'm going to walk into the black church and be like, black church Sunday, what's up? Puerto Rican church Sunday, what's up? I told Pastor Man, I said, hey, you better, you're Cuban. You're half Cuban. Quit messing around. Black church Sunday, just because you look black. We are intentionally a multi-ethnic church because we need to be with our brothers and sisters. We need to understand each other. It's easy to talk about each other when we're in our segregated states. Jesus didn't come to be no political, national, no, 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 no. He came to be a savior for the world. Verse 9, I'm, I'm getting ready to close in about five minutes. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him were shouting in praise and adoration. Hosanna to the son of David, Messiah, blessed, praised, glorified is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. You know what messed me up about that? Is that everybody was saying that. Everybody was singing praises. Everybody was saying Hosanna. But the problem is, is when we shout Hosanna with our mouth and not our heart. You know what it means, Hosanna? I looked it up in the Greek. The cry Hosanna meant save now. That's what it means, to save now. And on this day, the crowd received Jesus as a triumphant Messiah. This shows that the crowd in shouting save now had in mind political salvation from the oppression of the Romans. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus did not come to fulfill the will of the people, but the will of God. He didn't come to fulfill their will. He came to fulfill his father's will. Save us now, Jesus. Hosanna. No, 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 no. You're praising me without discernment. You don't know what I came to do. I came to die for my people. I came to die on the cross so that they could be set free. And whom the son sets free is free indeed. He did not come to fulfill. Let, let me help some of you. Stop fulfilling people's will. And seek your father's will. Amen, amen. Well, I just got to do what they tell me to do. No, you got to seek your father and listen to what he's telling you to do. Too many of us are moved by the crowd. We, we, we go where the crowd goes. Well, I, I, watch this. If I was to leave this, if I was to run out right now, what would you do? I was going to say something. I'm not going to say it because my wife is sitting right here. She's going to get mad at me if I say it. We know one demographic that would stay here like, what's going on? But the rest of us is out. Ask questions later. You ever see? What's going on? They walk right to it. Seriously? 
All right. This is why we're multi-ethnic. We got to understand each other. Ask them, why, you, why do you go ask questions? Run and ask later. <laughs> All right. Bring it back, Pastor. Bring it back. He did not come to fulfill the will of the people, but the will of God. Let me, let me help us. Because too many times, we're looking for people's approval. We're looking for man's approval. And some of us live off of man's approval. And people let you down, and then you just try to, I gotta, I gotta get approval from, I gotta get, and you gotta be careful with that. Because we are only to please the audience of one. I'm not here to please everybody. I'm not gonna please my wife all the time. She's not gonna please me all the time. If, but our, our job is to please him. And if we please him, everything else is gonna work out. Verse 10, I'm going to share this story that I was reading this in the first service. The Holy Spirit reminded me of this story. The Bible says, when he entered Jerusalem, all the, city. all the, city. So that was weak, all the, city. all the city was trembling with excitement, saying, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. When he entered Jerusalem, all the city and I realized this, I had my, my wife and I, when we started CWC, we had prayed this prayer, Lord, we want to reach 10% of this city for you. 62,000 people in the city of Gardena, that's 6,200. We've seen way more than that come through our doors. But I, I, as I was saying that, I remember us going to a pastor's retreat and we were invited to this retreat. We weren't invited actually, we weren't pastors yet. My parents were pastoring, we were under their ministry, we were youth pastors at the time. And my mom got sick and she couldn't, she couldn't go to the retreat. So they asked us, will you go? And so we said, yeah, we'll go. And we were in this retreat and we're not pastors, we're the only ones that weren't pastors. And we're sitting there and they did this part in the retreat where they put this map on the floor. And every pastor had a map of their city. And they had this bag that was sitting on top of the map of their city. And they said, in that bag is sand. And each strand of sand represents a person. And they said, uh, no, they had the sand on the map, I'm sorry. They said, each sand represents a person. And you just need to grab some sand and put it in the bag. That's what they told us to do. Grab some sand, put it in the bag. Huh? What, what you're believing for. And so, me and my wife, we were like, okay. So we started grabbing the sand and we saw some pastors and some pastors just grabbed a handful and put it in and closed their bag. Other pastors grabbed a little bit more and put it in their bag. And we just said, you know what? We're going to take all of it. And we were putting bag, we were putting the sand in the bag and all of a sudden I grabbed the map. I said, babe, open up that bag. And I, I folded the map and I let the sand go down. I said, we ain't letting one strand go and after the pastor said he said he said Reuben and Cindy were the only ones that get all the sand in the bag and this is prophetic he told us all he said because you're only believing what you can get but they're believing what God is about to give them I didn't know but I'm here to tell you all Jerusalem was trembling with excitement. What does that mean and why is that important? Because we realize that we're not, uh, we're, we're not a people-driven church, we're a presence-driven church. We want the presence of God here so thick that people are walking by and saying, what, what is going on there? I, I need to go in that church. That's happened to us many times where people were driving by and they say, ah, something pulled me in here or something told me to come inside there. That's the presence of God. All the city was trembling with excitement. Why is this important? Because are you excited every time you come into the house of God? Are you excited? Do you, do you feel a sense of expectation? And I realize that sometimes we allow our issues to drown out the expectation that we need to have in God. Are you expecting God to move in your family? 
If your kids aren't saved, are you expecting God to save them? If your spouse is not saved, are you expecting God to reach them? If you're in a business and your business is not doing well, are you expecting God, come on, to blow your business up? Are you expecting to get promoted? What are you expecting for? And too many times we expect the negative instead of expecting what God has for us. Ephesians 3 and 20, I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask, think, or even imagine that's the God that I'm expecting for. I'm expecting him to do the supernatural. I'm expecting him to do above and above all I can ask, think, or even imagine. I'm expecting. And that's the excitement. People were excited. They were trembling with excitement. And you should be excited because the King of Kings is here. The Lord of Lords is here. The Savior of the world is here. Come on, he, he's here to set you free. He's here to bless you. He's here to encourage you. He's here to use you. I have need of it. I have need of you. Oh my gosh. As I'm looking out here, I see my brother Carlos. Wave it up, Carlos. I have need of you. You see, I, I, we're almost done with the coffee shop. The coffee shop will launch officially Good Friday. On Good Friday, we're going to launch the coffee shop. And uh, uh, Carlos was sharing me. He had a dream. He had a dream before I even met him. He wasn't here in the service when the prophet gave me the word. And he had a dream. And he shared with me the dream that, 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 that God was going to bring him somebody. That he needed to help. Before the prophet came, all that. God will always prepare you. Are you excited with what God's about to do? Are you, are you, are you expecting? Because let me, let me share with you. As I shared with Carlos the day I met him. I had met him the two days before. And then he sprung it on me and said, you, I'm Carlos. I had been seeking and I had said God oh you gave me a word oh, I'm gonna act it out now because I was sitting right here and he gave me the word and I said God I'm gonna step in your word I'm gonna take steps of faith into your word now watch this because too many times we stay seated when God gives us a word and we don't move and I said, God, I'm going to move. And I went to, this, I went to the video and I began to look at the video. And as I'm looking at the video, I said, God, I need to meet Carlos. And I tell my wife, babe, we need to meet Carlos. We're going to go to Puerto Rico. <laughs> and she was like, sure. <laughs> We're going to go to the beach too. Don't worry. <laughs> I need to meet Carlos, God. And there's an activation when, when God gives you a word. There has to be an activation on your part. Because God gives us word, but if I don't activate it, it stays dormant. How do I know this? Because Jesus told his, he instructed his disciples, go get the colt. He told them, go get it. If they would have stayed there, what would have happened? That he would have never got the colt. He had to activate it. So I, I, I began to activate it. And I told him, oh, we got to meet Carlos, we got to meet Carlos, we got to meet Carlos, we got to meet Carlos. I don't know where he is. There's a million Carlos in Puerto Rico. Couldn't he pick an easier name? Somebody that's like odd? He didn't even give me a last name. I could have, I could have Google out him. Google out. It says, Carlos, Carlos, you're going to meet a Carlos. And I'm going to bring him to you. I said, okay, God, I need to find him. Driving to church Saturday because Carlos was already demoing here. He was coming to demo and I didn't know his name. He told me, Pastor, I can't charge you. I said, well, we'll start work. Let's go. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to get the hookup, guys. Help me out. We, you don't want the hookup? Give him to me. Uh. Carlos, I meet him and he tells me the story. I'm Carlos. And I almost start crying right there. I said, wait, you got to tell my wife. Because just yesterday I said, I need to find Carlos. Here's what it is. If you're expectant, God tends to show up. But if you're stagnant, God says, I can't do nothing for you because you're stagnant. 
And I'm here to tell you, looking at carnals here is a fulfillment of prophecy. But I had to do my part. See, when you come to this place, oh, here's the last scripture. When you come to this place, I know it's not always in great terms. I know it's not always you're, you're, you're having the best time or, or you're, you're always you're doing great. Now, I know it's not that all the time. But if you come here with the right heart and the right attitude, God always tends to show up. Watch this. Verse 39, and I'm closing right here. Verse 39 and 40. The Bible says this, and we're going back to Luke, Luke 19, 39 and 40. And I'm closing here. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples for shouting these messianic praises. Rebuke them. Jesus replied, I tell you, if these people keep silent, the stones will cry out in praise. Now watch this, because this is important. The critics came out when Jesus was close to his destiny. The critics came out when Jesus was close to his destiny. Let me say it like this. Your critics will start sounding louder the closer you get to your destiny. I haven't realized how many critics we've had and it's been a battle and I realize oh we got to be close because they start getting louder and it starts stinging a little bit see you don't care about the critics that you don't care about but when the critics are close to home it hurts that church ain't never gonna grow Pastor Ruben said it for years. Your critics will start sounding louder the closer you get to your destiny. And your critics will quit on you too. People shouted his praises one day and the next day they shouted crucify him. They did. Those same people that said, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those same people were the same ones the next day that said, crucify him same people and then his disciples they weren't even there they took off they went back fishing remember last couple weeks your critics will start sounding louder the closer you get to your destiny so if it's loud get ready if it's loud get get ready because you're close to your destiny you're close to what God has for you the enemy has tried to keep you away from your purpose, but you're close to it. You're close to it. You're close to it. Okay. Verse 40. It says, Jesus replied, I tell you, if these people keep silent, the stones will cry out in praise. Here's, here's the important thing about that. Nothing tells Satan and his demons that they have lost like the praises of God's people. Nothing tells Satan and his demons that they have lost like the praises that you give God. See, Satan loses because when God's people are really worshiping, their hearts and minds are on him. Not on sin, self, or Satan's distractions. If I'm truly worshiping, and this is why it's so important that you come with a heart ready to worship. See, we get ready for things that don't matter. We have our clothes ready for Disneyland. That all of you have passes. And you still gonna spend $300 on food. You get your outfit ready. You got a match. To go see an animal that's really not an animal. <laughs> Mickey's fake. I, I kid you not. We go, we go all the time. And I'm 49. We got the grandkids. Babe, there's Mickey. <laughs> Hurry up, kids. <laughs> and it's Shelly underneath that outfit. It's Billy underneath that outfit. We will stand in line for hours waiting for a parade that lasts five minutes, shouting at people that don't even know you exist, that don't care you exist. Mickey, Minnie, Moana. Cinderella I seen some of you because I go to Disney all the time I seen some of you grown people 
with no kids. <laughs> Pushing kids out of the way. <laughs> I can't go. I'll start fighting. Like, Lord, he's still dealing with me on that. That's why we go on Tuesday. We don't go on Saturday or Friday. <laughs> You're grown. Get out of the way. My grandkids need to see Mickey and Minnie. <laughs> Praising Mickey and Minnie. But when we come to God's house, we're like this. Worthy is the Lamb. Jesus, you deserve the praise. We don't even lift our hands. You don't lift your hands because you're bound. It's hard to lift your hands when you got things holding you down. You ever been sleeping? Oh, I'm about to prophesy to some of you. You ever been sleeping and you're trying to get up but you can't get up? Those are called demons that are holding you down. You ever try to shout and you can't because you feel like something's holding your mouth? That's a demon trying to stop you from shouting the name Jesus. Jesus replied, if I tell you, if these people keep silent, the stones will cry out. Let me tell you something. The stones? A rock? Oh my gosh. Anyone who says, praise the Lord, should be able to answer this question. Praise him for what? You see, the Pharisees, everybody, the, 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 the Bible says that the whole city was, was, was gleaming with excitement. They were all shouting Hosanna. They were shouting it with their mouth, but not with their heart. They did it because the crowd did it. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you, are you doing it? Or I'm asking you this question. Are you doing it because what has he done for you? Why do you praise Jesus? Let me tell you something. If I'm going to cry Hosanna, I recognize that if it wasn't for Jesus, me and my wife wouldn't be together and my son and my daughter-in-law wouldn't have any babies. If it wasn't for Jesus, where would you be? If it wasn't for the blood, would you even be saved? No, you wouldn't. If it wasn't for Jesus who set you free. Come on, some of us were bound and we were going to go crazy, but because of Jesus, I shout praises to Jesus. Come on, if you don't cry out, the rocks are going to cry out instead. And ain't no rock going to cry out for me. He's been too good to me. He's been too good to my family. He's done too much for me. And I praise you, Jesus, for your worthy to be praised. If you keep silent, the rocks will praise in your place. If you keep silent, the rocks are going to praise for you. And I'm here to encourage you today. Open your mouth. And praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on, there is no other. He's the great I am. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. The 24 elders bow down and cry, Holy, holy, holy is the one who is and was and is to come. Come on, if they're doing it in heaven, we got to do it on the earth. I got to praise him because he's been too good. Come on, some of you better get louder than you're getting because he's been too good to you. He kept you out of that crazy hospital. He kept you healed. He, he oh my. You better come in his house expecting something. Like I expected Carlos. I said, God, you're going to bring me Carlos. And God brought me Carlos. And now that coffee shop is done, but we ain't stopping there. We got other places to go. We got other things to do. And I'm going to praise you because you said it, I'm going to walk in it. Stop worrying about your critics and open your mouth and praise the Lord. Listen, let me tell you, some of your critics are going to be from your own home. And those are the ones that try to keep us paralyzed. Don't let it happen. He's been too good to you. He's blessed you too much. Come on, some of us should have been dead, but Jesus... Some of us should have been dead, but Jesus. So praise him for what? I want to remind you to remind yourself of what he's done for you. And what's coming is massive. I'm prophesying that over this house. What's coming is massive. We ain't going to be here long because we ain't going to fit here long. We're going to walk around that casino like the Israelites did. We're going to walk around it like they did at the Charles. Before you leave, we're going to walk around that thing. 
You know Charles and Valerie were ones that walked around it? The, the forum? They were on their, their team. Bishop Omer. And that she, the Lord just showed me right now. That's part of them, their fulfillment. It's to walk around another building. Because it ain't going to be everybody. Because not everybody believes that casino is going to be a church. But there's all I need is two or three. That can believe that are crazy like me and my wife. The hustler cas- And I'm telling you right now, Carlos and Emerson and their company is going to be the ones doing the remodel there. God's setting everything up. He's setting everything up. You better. Somebody better believe with me. He's setting everything up. That's why Adan had to go work for Netflix so he can learn the technology that we're going to need. Some of you don't get it. It's a setup. It's a setup. It's a setup. It's a setup. It's a. Oh. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? The Lord promised that the casino, the Hustle Casino, would be our church. About 25 years ago, I walked around that thing seven times because the Lord told me to. And now, and now, we're walking in fulfillment. And let me tell you something. This is why you got to praise God when things look impossible. I think God loves that word impossible. Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. Come on, stand to your feet. I'm going to keep on preaching. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep on preaching. And we're going to practice this. Here's what's going to happen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I, I want to give someone the opportunity to know Jesus. Maybe you're here and you're saying, Pastor, I, you've been excited about that guy you're talking about. I don't know him. Well, you have an opportunity to know him. I'm excited because he's been so good to me. And a person like me where I feel like, man, God, I'm not even worthy. He says, I'm going to use you, son. And as I said in the beginning, there's some of you that you felt like unworthy. You're not worthy. Let me cancel that out. Because Jesus used a donkey. He can use anybody. And I want you to know that there is purpose for your life. If you're standing there, you don't know Jesus. I'm going to count to three. All you got to do is raise your hand. If you're watching online, this is for you as well. Maybe you're standing there saying, Pastor, I knew Jesus, but I fell away. I made too many mistakes. Listen, listen, you have breath in your body. That means you have another opportunity to rededicate your life to Christ. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand real high. Say, I want to give my life to Christ uh, for the first time, or I want to give my life back to Christ. If that's you, nobody's looking. It's between you and God. One, two, three. Come on, raise it up if that's you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There's hands all across this room. I want you to pray. I want the church to repeat this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Today, I give you my life. I surrender to you with all that I am. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you for your people today. Thank you for their lives. I thank thank you for what you're about to do. Lord, I even hear this in my spirit that for some of them the critics are so loud it has paralyzed them. And I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I rebuke every lying thought that's from the enemy. And I pray, Lord, that you release their minds right now. Lord, that they take every thought captive and make it obedient to you, Jesus. I bless their lives right now. They will reach the purpose that you have designed for them to reach. They will reach their destiny as they surrender to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and all God's people said, amen and amen.